Good evening and welcome to all of you. And welcome to the sixth annual Morton Marcus Memorial Poetry Reading. This is the, one of the final events of our 50th anniversary year. This event honors Morton Marcus, a nationally acclaimed poet who called Santa Cruz his home for more than 50 years. For six, for six years now, this reading has recognized and celebrated the significant role that poetry has played in our community's history. And it helps maintain poetry's influence in Santa Cruz County. I want to acknowledge the important role that Donna Meckes plays in champion Mort's legacy and in sustaining poetry here on campus as well as in the community. Donna and Mort were married on campus. And Donna, an alumna, remains active in the campus community. Currently, I'm very pleased to say she's the president of the UC Santa Cruz Alumni Association. So thank you very much, Donna, for doing this. Morton Marcus's archive, his books, personal papers, manuscripts, recordings, and correspondence is available, completely available to the public here in the special collections and archives of McHenry Library. Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce our Master of Ceremonies for the evening, Gary Young. Gary is an exceptionally accomplished poet with many books and national awards to his credit. He's also one of our own, a UC Santa Cruz graduate. He is also the director of the Cowell Press and has been teaching poetry, book arts, and fine printing here at UC Santa Cruz for 10 years. I'm sure many of you know and love him as Santa Cruz's first poet laureate. Please join me in welcoming Gary Young. Thank you, Chancellor Blumenthal, and thank all of you for coming out tonight. Uh, welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, it is my very great pleasure uh, to welcome you to the sixth annual Morton Marcus Memorial Poetry Reading. We at UC Santa Cruz are fortunate that this year's reading is part of the fall 2015 Living Writers Reading Series Creative Work and Critical Play organized by our own Ronaldo Wilson. The Living Writers Reading Series has many sponsors, which will be shortly, <laughs> very shortly, there they are, um, and we'd like to thank them heartily. Uh, tonight's Morton Marcus Memorial Poetry Reading would not have been possible without the hard work of many people and the support of several institutions. I would like to thank our many sponsors, Alv Family Properties, Poetry Santa Cruz, and the Cultural Council of Santa Cruz County, UCSC Creative Writing Program, and UCSC Special Collections and Archives, Cabrillo College English Department, and Santa Cruz Writes. I would also like to acknowledge the Morton Marcus Memorial Organizing Committee, and in particular, our colleague, Mark Ong, Mort's dear friend, and literary executor who designed seven poems for Morton Marcus, the beautiful chat book you were given when you came in tonight. After Mort died, several of his friends sent poems to Mort's wife, Donna. And over time, the number of poems grew until they hit critical mass, the magnificent seven. Um, and Donna and Mark collected them into this wonderful chat book. The seven poets represented are Tom Meshery, Jack Marshall, Ronnie Hess, Joe Stroud, David Sullivan, and Al Young. Uh, we're fortunate to have some of them here tonight. I know that Joe and Al are here. I think David is here too. If, if, can you raise your hand so that people can see? There you are, hi. Um, Al's right here. Joe, you're not hiding, are you? There he is, okay. Um, let me give my hand. Beautiful 
Every year, the Morton Marcus Memorial Reading Series brings distinguished poets from across the country to honor one of our premier writers, a man recognized nationally as a distinguished poet, novelist, memoirist, film, and literary critic. But Mort was a man, we must also remember, as one of the progenitors of Santa Cruz County's vital poetic and artistic culture. A student of mine a few days ago pointed to the poster announcing this uh, event and asked me, who is Morton Marcus? And for us old timers, it's easy to forget that young poets wouldn't remember him uh, and might not have encountered his poems yet, poems yet. And whether the new generation of poets has yet to make the connection, they are riding a wave that Morton Marcus helped set in motion. The abundance of local poetry readings, slams, open mics, and literary free-for-alls in our town have origins in the readings that Mort organized in the early 70s at Zachary, which was really the seed of everything that's gone on since. Mort's legacy is also represented by the countless students who began their poetic journeys in the classes that Mort taught at Cabrillo College for 30 years. He was indefatigable, a presence. And in addition to his writing, his teaching, and his community organizing, Mort held court on KUSP's The Poetry Show, and he hosted a popular television program. Mort received the Gail Rich Award, and he was honored as a Santa Cruz County Poet, or excuse me, Santa Cruz County Artist of the Year. It would not be unfair to describe him as a human whirlwind. Those who knew him will never forget him, and those who meet him through his body of work are privy to a great spirit. Every year, I have the pleasure to begin this uh, poetic event by reading a few of Morton's poems. It's something I look forward to more every year. Uh, I'd like to start tonight with Rejoice With Me from The Dark Figure in the Doorway, Last Poems, a poem listening to rain from Pursuing the Dream Bone, and end with another very short poem from the Santa Cruz Mountain Poems, a poem called A Weed. As I mentioned every year, it's, I have to resist the impulse to channel Mort. If anyone listened, and I know many of you have heard Mort read, uh, it was inimitable, but it's, it's hard, because I hear his voice when I read his poems. Um, you're going to have to hear my voice, but his words. Rejoice with me. Rejoice with me. I feel my face shining behind its bones as it did before my parents were born. How can I describe the sensation of sinking through one identity after another, of endlessly falling from one mask to the next, my face collapsing and reappearing, each time different yet the same? Some faces I recognize, others I've never seen or have forgotten, the one and the many, all of them drifting off like nodes of life among all the other nodes scattering like fireflies throughout the universe. <clears throat> Masks were very important to Morton. The idea that one could could change from one identity to another. Uh, it's a theme that he takes up over and over in his work. Uh, this is my favorite book of Mort's, I don't mind admitting. Um, prose poems and, and marvelously gnomic little things that I just love. This poem is called Listening to the Rain. 
A man listens to the rain falling outside the house. He hears birds chirping through the downpour as he places a record of the rainstorm on the phonograph. Now the storm is all around him, and he cannot tell which bird voices are actually singing and which are recorded. Birds with dripping wings rise from the phonograph and flutter around the room. The man doesn't know if he should open the window or sit where he is. The water rises around his easy chair. His clothes are soaked. The man wonders if he should have played the record or just listened to the rain. He doesn't know if he is inside or outside, if he is the house surrounded by rain or if the storm is inside him. That's good stuff. <laughs> it's a very, very small poem, but beautiful. A weed. If, if you see this book, and I encourage uh, my students to, to look for more in the bookstores, but this, this book in particular, if you have fallen in love with Santa Cruz, um, as it's easy to do, this is kind of a love home, this book, to, to the Redwoods and, and to this area. The weed puts out its hand. Take it. Hold fast. We are flying into a long night. Morton Marcus. For the past four years, a uh, national poetry competition has been held to honor Morton. And it's a great pleasure to welcome my dear friend, Jory Post. He's a writer, printer, book artist, and the power behind many literary and educational endeavors in our community, including Santa Cruz Rights and Frenzy. And he will introduce this year's winning poet, Jory. Thanks, Gary. As Gary said, this is the fourth year of the poetry contest. Uh, in 2012, David Sullivan was the winner. In 2013, Danusha Lemiris won. And last year, Marsha De La O won. Uh, we'll learn shortly who the winner is for this year. Um, the contest continues to thrive and celebrate the life and work of Mort. And a lot of that has to do with the support of our family property and George Al Jr. George, thank you. <laughs> the contest also continues to generate a large number of submissions and that has a lot to do with the great quality of the judges that we've had over the years, including Gary Young, Al Young. This year, uh, Steve, yeah. Stephen Kessler was our judge. Stephen, are you here? There he is. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> Stephen read uh, hundreds of poems this year and was able to se select one that best represented the spirit of Morton. <laughs> now I'd like to introduce the winner and tell you a little bit about her. I'd like to congratulate Alexandra Borilski for winning the fourth annual Morton Marcus contest with her poem, A Letter. Let me tell you a little bit about her before she comes up and reads her poem and gets her check. <laughs> Alexandra was raised near the Atlantic but loves her new life near the Pacific. She's a writing teacher in the Bay Area and she continues her poetry workshops with former students at the East Palo Alto Library. She's working to make her writing workshops for teen girls in this low-income area regularly available and easily accessible. Her poetry has appeared in Echoes of LBI and Ruminate magazine. Her prose is knocking about in various places on the internet, of which I read about three or four articles uh, in the last few days. Congratulations, Alexandra. Uh, 
um, why I'm incredibly honored to receive this award, and I am just so excited to be present for um, tonight with Al Young and to hear him read. Um, it's always a pleasure to hear a poet um, read their work when so much of it is just on the page. So I'd like to dedicate this reading to my students. A letter. For my student who isn't blonde or visible in national news and didn't win a contest, grade levels behind in reading and writing, but who depends on poetry, clearing quiet spaces through days cramped with laundry, gunshots, too many cousins under one roof, and scars on wrists. I see you. For my student who heard appetite for the first time and knows about stoops difficult to rise from, this poem is witness to that unnamed heart hunger thoughts keeping you from being the usual first to the lunch line. I see you. For my student who knows visions can rise over cockroaches and lice, and who asks with Gwendolyn Brooks how to keep dreams clean. For my student who swears to God and mother graduation will happen. For my student who makes tired summer school promises and requests poetry in detention. I see you. For my student who thinks metaphor is stupid, thinks it won't extend strong, won't iridesce, refuses the heart its power. For my student who receives poetry as a serious answer to unspoken questions. For my student who thinks I don't notice back row ears listening as I read aloud, I see you. For my student who's never seen Nebraska or life more than 45 minutes from our city and imagines cooser shoes farm worn and mice filled. For my student who didn't know poetry could be about a good life, I see you. For my student reading Loose Woman, seeing familiar hips and language and laughing where my limited Spanish bars admittance. For you who teach me new signs and tell me stories these poems are breaking open. I see you. For my students who put unknown words on their tongues, who trust in spells these sounds cast and allow words to work over their insides where they tear and build, tear and build muscles of resistance and compassion. For my students learning to see themselves in language, I see you. Thank you, Alexandra, and again, congratulations, what a wonderful poem. Friendship was very important to Morton. He made friends easily, and his friendships were strong, passionate, and enduring. His literary friendships were particularly important to him. Mort loved nothing more than talking, prefer preferably over a good meal and a good bottle of wine with friends, and to talk about art, literature, and life. One of Mort's dearest friends, a compadre and fellow traveler, is tonight's reader, Al Young. Sometimes I think that the internet may have been invented just to keep track of Al Young's prolific production of essays, <laughs> poems, novels, podcasts, audio clips, photos, memoirs, screenplays, and anthologies. I'm probably missing some, but um, take my word for it. As Poet Lord of California from 2005 through 2008, Al Young not only brought poetry to the schools, the streets, and the art houses of California, he created one of the most impressive resources for poetry on the web. And I recommend that you check it out, if you've got some time. Um, you can get lost in it. Born in Mississippi in 1939, Al grew up in the South, moved to Detroit, and attended the University of Michigan. When he was 22, he migrated to the Bay Area, and California has claimed him ever since. Al has taught poetry, fiction, and literature at colleges and universities around the countries and abroad, places 
like Rice University, the University of Washington, University of Arkansas, and many others. But he graduated from Cal, and for nearly 50 years, he's taught in California at Stanford, San Jose State, UC Davis, UC Berkeley, and of course, here at UC Santa Cruz. We were privileged to have Al in our creative writing classes today, and I must confess that he raises the bar very high. <laughs> Al has received too many awards and honors and accolades to list in their entirety, but they include Guggenheim Fulbright and NEA fellowships, the Penn Literary of Congress Award for Short Fiction, the Penn USA Award for Nonfiction, two Pushcart Prizes, two American Book Awards, two, two, you get, it's like, Al. You know, when my kids take cookies like that, you know, it's just like, hey, leave some for, for the rest of us. <laughs> the Richard Wright Award for Literary Excellence and the 2011 Thomas Wolfe Award. Al is the author of some 22 books. He is a musical as well as a literary scholar. And the sentiments he expresses in the poem for the great bassist Vernon Alley, of Vernon's Alley, could as easily apply to him. His smile can light up wood as good as pluck, all spark, no match, his fingers on some fuse hooked up to soul, an ammunition truck. Whole worlds go up when Vernon plays the blues, and whole worlds go up when Al Young reads his poetry. Please join me in welcoming Al Young. There's so much that can be said about uh, Morton Marcus that I won't even attempt to scratch the surface, but we were friends for decades, and curiously, we met down here in Santa Cruz. Uh, I first lived in Berkeley in the 1960s, and uh, one of the first writers that I started a serious correspondence with was the late James D. Houston, who was also a friend of Mort's, and he got us together. And we were standing, I remember, at a party, some kind of picnic, and uh, Mort said, come, come over here with me where I parked my car. I have something to show you. And so I walked over there and he opened up the trunk and he took out, um, I think it was the Santa Cruz Mountain poems. Uh, and I went to my car and brought out something that, you know, I, I didn't have an official publication yet, but I put something out myself. And it was a, a magazine, <clears throat> a literary magazine called Love Letter. It was mimeographed with a, a photocopied, uh, a lithographed uh, cover. And they were all now collector's items. But we stood there and we talked for so long that uh, we'd forgotten about the party. And that conversation continued for years and years and years. In fact, I was mentioning this afternoon uh, in Ronaldo, uh, Dr. Ronaldo Collins' uh, class that we would talk for so long that my wife would say, hey, you know, would you get off the phone after an hour and a half? Because we got to do this. And I would hear uh, his wife in the background, uh, I think it was Donna, uh, saying, saying uh, no, in the old days it was Wilma, but we continued this for so long that Donna was doing it too. Mort, would you get off the phone? We, we got to do something here. Uh, he was a very complex person who loved life, and in an interview that uh, I did with him once, he said that he had always been fond of the ecstatic, uh, all the way from childhood. And people who knew Mort know that he had drive that was insurpassable. I mean, he knew about film, he knew about food, he knew about literature, he knew about uh, politics and history. Uh, he was particularly fond of Eastern European uh, history. Uh, there was nothing uh, he didn't know anything about. And you didn't know if this came from erudition or intuition or what. And he noticed everything. And I was particularly impressed with his knowledge of film because he could, he memorized films, he, he memorized sequences. And if he had a copy of it, if he had a VHS in the old days, he would uh, rewind it to the point where he could show you uh, what was going on uh, with that particular producer or that studio or that actor or some clandestine relationship that was happening backstage that he happened to know about. 
Uh, I was once going to lecture on uh, D.W. Griffith's infamous uh, Birth of a Nation down in Louisiana, and Mort said, before you go down there, uh, we did a show on that. You know, he had a, a, a weekly, uh, I think, cable access show, public access show, which was excellent. He would dress up in costumes, like if he's do, he was doing a Western thing, he'd put on a cowboy hat. If he was doing a Civil War thing, he'd put on a Civil War outfit. Uh, he was very dramatic uh, that way in everything that he did. And he said, uh, we did a, a, a segment on uh, Birth of a Nation that I think would help you. And it absolutely did. He had things about uh, that movie and about D.W. Griffith that I didn't know about. And I borrowed some of his advice and gave a, uh, quite a striking talk uh, down in Louisiana. Here's the poem that I wrote uh, for the chapbook to tribute uh, to him uh, from Seven Poets. You listened. You watched. In memory of Morton Marcus, 1936 to 2009. Over and over, mountain to river, you, Mort, delivered the goods. New York, GI, Stanford, a lover. Over and over, you cooked good food, you understood, you fed, you gave big time, pensive, wine and bread. Over and over, you listened, you watched, you reached for the moon in tongues, language alone frees up. You coached, over and over, you spelled it out. You had no doubt Plato was wrong. Banned poets from his republic? What? Over and over, idea and song mixed and sometimes matched. As fiercely as you loved, you longed. Over and over, you walked the sea. You talked to me. You gave your heart over to poetry. Paradise. Ecstasy. This wobbly podium is throwing me off a little bit, so forgive me. That was the spirit uh, uh, that I loved about Mort. Uh, he loved life. He had his ornery side, as we all do. But this is a happy moment to be able to tell him, because uh, I'm sure he's around. Uh, I think he actually helped me write that poem, uh, to tell him how much uh, we loved him and how much we appreciate him. And I wish that he could be here uh, tonight. So uh, in tribute to Mort, I'm going to read uh, mostly new stuff. I want to start out with a poem about tango. What I love about Argentine tango is that it starts out as a, a disreputable, uh, unrespectable form of music, very much like the blues. And then it ends up being universally iconic and symbolic of so many things that it becomes a huge industry. I mean, Argentina spends billions of dollars a year uh, to uh, cultivate the tango industry. And uh, the tango comes about in the 19th century when African uh, bonded laborers came to uh, Argentina, you know, to work in the silver mines and do all the other menial work that we still need slaves to do uh, all over the world. But they also brought in uh, people from Eastern Europe, you know, from Poland, from uh, uh, Hungary. And so the meeting of these two musical cultures, uh, the African culture and the Eastern European culture, uh, produced the tango. And this poem is about that. But it starts out with an epigraph from the New York Times that I read back in February of 2008, uh, written, uh, an article uh, written by a guy named Eric Nagorny. When the band strikes up a tango, people with Parkinson's disease may want to head for the dance floor. And what they found out is if you teach uh, people with Parkinson's uh, the tango, they get better. That is, their symptoms are released. And I think the arts in general uh, are healing and can be used as medicine. We just don't think about it uh, in those terms. Language still pretty much determines our consciousness. And uh, 
I'm going to sing a part of a little song written by two guys named Bernier and uh, Brennan. Uh, and some of you might know it if you're old enough. I think Bing Crosby was the first one to sing it, but there are lots of hit versions of it. And it was one of John Coltrane's uh, favorite songs. Let's see if I can get the right key. Don't whisper things to me that you don't mean, for words deep inside can be seen by the night. The night has a thousand eyes, and a night can tell a heart that's true from one that lies. Mort and I spent a lot of time talking about language and how important it was, uh, if you were a writer uh, uh, with language as your instrument, uh, to respect it and to uh, go just beyond using it to deceive or to manipulate, uh, which is what language is used for all too much uh, in our era. So uh, here's the poem. Tango Good to Go, it's called. The tango and the blues shared more than funk and disrespect. Their pulse and heart moan softly in the here and now and swell with touch in what touch needs to mean. Whether hand in hand or slyly mouth to mouth, we move, we live again. The steps we share still every deathly fear. Our limbs know what it means that you can lean into my outer step, the blood orange of our dancing duds a sultry tip-off. Darling, when Africa calls, delayed responses sway. And yet the abanera and candombe egg us on, egg static forces forward. Big forms of blues feel endless sometimes, fast, swirling deep up from the bloodstream, blending sunrise with the closest moon to earth in years. And when you move your face to mine, dark sky or background, I know nothing will dissolve that is not form. Long live local movements. I hope I've got all the pages here. Oh, here it is. Uh, some years ago, I was listening to Living on Earth, the uh, public radio show, uh, Public Radio International, and I heard a woman named Ingrid Hillegrand. Uh, she was from the Orange County uh, Sanitation District, and uh, the program was called Toilet to Tap. You know, now they can actually take toilet water and water that you've washed your, taken a bath in, and purify it to the point where it's, it's uh, drinkable, uh, potable. And of course, we know, given the class structure of our world now, and the direction it's moving in, that poor people will be drinking that water. Uh, and the 1% will be drinking, you know, whatever is left of uh, pure water. But here's what she said, and this opens a poem called Away, Away, Away. When you flush the toilet, when you brush your teeth, the water just goes away, and nobody really thinks about where away is. But that's where I work, where away is. Nothing ever goes away, and many don't know this, but no new water has come in uh, to Earth, and no water goes out. We eventually drink all the water that we pee out uh, or that we flush out. Uh, you know, it, it might be distasteful to have to think of that, but that's, that's, that's how uh, uh, interbound we are. So I wrote this poem in honor of a, a broadcaster who was a fellow Detroiter named Andrea Lewis, who died the same year that Mort died, around the same time. And it's called Away, 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 What Does It Mean? In memory of Andrea Lewis, 1957 to 2009. With no away, you can't get lost or drown. You can't just disappear. You're trapped right here. This sticky, spidery web still holds its own. What does it mean when we think far or near? What do we do? when we throw stuff away? What happens when we flush? What follows what? The other ends of dreams unfold. You stay in place right where you are. Yes, you stay put, or so you think. Imagine how the sun felt back in feudal days when we assumed our earth was flat. Imagine everyone asleep in such belief. 
What insight bloomed? What twilight rose to open people's eyes? I'm up here moving, folks, the sun might feel. How long before you Christians realize there's more than gold that shines? Light shines for real. And where does sunlight go? What does it do? Light feeds each breath we take. Light circulates and in its round and round produces you and me and everything that jumps or waits. The uh, wonderful Canadian poet Jan Zawicki uh, has a line that I really love. It says, uh, light, I'm pretty much sure, is love. Jan Zawicki. Fluent. I always love that word. We were talking a lot today about the debt that uh, English since 1066 uh, owes to the Norman invasion because uh, the vocabulary of English doubled, if not tripled, with the introduction of, uh, of French into it. And those Latinate usages, which we get from Rome and then we get them again from uh, the Normans. And fluent just has such a nice ring to it. And I wrote it for a singer a friend of mine who goes by the one name of uh, Dima. Because I've watched her develop over about 15 years into a really wonderful singer. Uh, she started out with a lot of talent, but now it's just a pleasure to hear this nuance, another French word. Fluent for Dima. To move from note to note, from step to stop, instinctually, as needed, poetry, pure fluency. She flows, she flattens fifths the way she eased him out when he got fresh. She knows nuance. The sub-subjunctive mode still works. Been me, out of bend and gone, even if, even if it meant jump. Fluent, she oozed from mode to mode, from key to key, from breath to breath octave to octave, pulse to pause. She sang, she grew the moves. One, one, zero, one, her voice outdistanced, code. I had told, uh, I think, uh, uh, Ronaldo's class that I was gonna read a poem called In the Realm of Film because I was doing a little uh, bit in his class about how film is poetry, because we're talking about imagery, uh, and most people don't look at it that way. Uh, I also mentioned that poets quite often make uh, better screenwriters, or more effective screenwriters than prose writers, because prose writers are used to controlling everything that you think or think you're reading, whereas poets know how to abbreviate things and condense them and to use imagery to, to get uh, the story across or ideas across. And uh, film is, is all imagery. But I forgot to bring it, so. <laughs> Let me read another poem before I get to that one. Uh, it's called After Afternoons of Wonder and Thundering Rain. The sooner this zone swoons under its own light, the sooner our recovery from wet afternoons of wonder and thundering rain. You wore your year of panties inside out, disclosing in December the cloistered winter you who couldn't change. Telegraph Avenue dashed and dotted its signals, gifts and messages and passages stretched all up and down its dazzling zones. Cool or hot, we felt its reach. A sigh you exhaled hung still in the air, freezing dream bubbles, longing to pop. You wore your silver city around your body in full peyote glow. New dimensions and otherworldliness. Hey, no big bang thing. The love that carried us stained and sustains us. Afternoon rains.
Uh, I was asked by Wayne State University uh, recently to, they're doing an anthology of Detroit writers and they still recognize me as a Detroit writer in the same way that Mississippi recognizes me as a Mississippi writer. Uh, so these identities are fragile. Uh, and they asked me to write about uh, jazz and particularly bebop uh, in the 1950s when I was adolescent growing up. So I wrote a piece uh, that I'm only going to read a couple of passages from because it's too long. Uh, the book will be coming out in a few months. Uh, and the title is A Top-Down Motown Bebop Pubescence. Four takes. I'm going to read takes one and two. Mort would have called this a prose poem. I, I think I agree. But uh, prose poems are made of poetry as well as prose. One, for any instrument that rose to my ear, I'd mastered my deft air versions. Hand jive. Except for some real life trumpet or piano now and again, I conducted my imaginary concert listening sessions with creative gusto. Saxophones, trombones, French horn, oboe, harp, harpsichord, guitar, clarinet, flute, violin, bass, drums, I had it covered. All I had to do then was blow the dust off my sapphire or diamond stylus, set the needle tone arm down in the groove, and let the vinyl swirl. Two, with the friendliest of crackles, universes floated, coating my brain and heart, kicking up sound all around. You talk about your big bang, music was the biggest. Invisible worlds ruled by vibration. While some of it I got or kind of understood the delicious mysteries that power most music and poetry. I hope I got the right page here. <laughs> Electrify me yet, I had the wrong page. Like all adolescents, I daydreamed big time. A common fantasy saw me performing the featured solo, the juicy part, to a special section reserved for wowing womanly girls I long to woo. I have a friend, um, I have a bunch of friends from uh, my high school uh, who live right in the Bay Area, and many of them live within blocks of me. And one of them is, is uh, a psycholinguist retired from UC Berkeley, who's quite world-renowned, named Dan Slobin, Dan I. Slobin, who speaks about 12 languages. We started out in the seventh grade learning Spanish together, and he just, in uh, University of Michigan, in my sophomore year, I took Russian, because I wanted to know, you know, how Russian worked. And it was during the, uh, the heart of the McCarthy era, we're talking about 1958 or something like that, and uh, I lived in a dorm full of engineers who would walk around with slide rules on their belts. And uh, they were very patriotic, I guess you would call them. And I would get these notes on my door that would say, uh, you goddamn red, if you like Russia so much, why don't you go and live there? You know? uh, but it, uh, a year later, Sputnik went up and they were all studying Russian. So that's, that's how it goes. <laughs> but Dan spends half his year uh, in the Netherlands uh, in Groningen, uh, uh, he, he, uh, there's another linguist that he's fallen in love with. They've been doing this for 25 years uh, without getting married. She'd come over here for a few months, he'd go over there. And now she's uh, developed uh, Alzheimer's. And uh, she's very dramatic, and I talk to her sometimes on the phone. And her name is Nini, and I wrote this sonnet for her just very recently. In last night's dream, I heard you say, should I let go, or should I stay? I had no answer, not a clue. Portions of me still stirred in you. Let me, let me back up on this. In the Netherlands, uh, they've long had uh, uh, legalized euthanasia. You know, you can opt to just check out, uh, which I think they've, uh, they have up in Oregon uh, also. So that's the issue. That'll give the poem a little bit more depth. And last night, because she had threatened, she's threatened twice to check out, but when Dan goes over there, she falls back in love again, and, and you know, everything is all right for a while. In last night's dream, I heard you say, should I let go, 
or should I stay? I had no answer, not a clue. Portions of me still stirred in you. We leaked into a shadow void so vast that I felt overjoyed with halves light let me see as whole. No night, no day, no heart, no soul, no pain, no pleasure dome, just quiet. This made me smile. You couldn't buy it. In soft sign language, that's her specialty is signing, uh, particularly uh, in uh, child and adolescent culture. In soft sign language, can you tell stories of heaven from stories of hell? In last night's dream, I read your smile. Forever only lasts a while. Thank you. I met uh, Lily Tomlin, whose real name is Mary Jean uh, Tomlin. She changed it to Lily. In the fifth grade, uh, when I first moved up to Detroit uh, at Crosman Elementary School. And uh, we formed a friendship that lasted for years. Uh, she dropped out of high school because she was so talented, she couldn't stand high school. And so uh, we had lunch one day and I told her to flee, you know, get out of here. And uh, you know the rest. She went to New York and started doing those telephone commercials. And uh, you know, she's still in the picture. Uh, this was written for her. Every now and then she'll leave a voice message on, on my telephone, uh, remembering the old days. Uh, I think I explained this in the, in the poem, but maybe, maybe I didn't. Uh, it was in the, oh yeah, it's in the poem, I don't have to tell you. It's called Don't Go Breaking My Heart for Lily Tomlin. Of all the flat ass working class white girls I grew up with, Detroit, yeah, I like that line too. <laughs> Of all the flat-ass, working-class white girls I grew up with, Detroit, you stood out. You are still my funniest, cleverest, loveliest of all. Mary Jean Tomlin, Lily. For our ninth grade stage adaptation assignment to write, I chose Mark Twain's fence paint scene from Tom Sawyer. You were Becky Thatcher. You starred. I played Tom. What daring, darling casting then. Miss Wetzel, our auditorium teacher, did not care. A communist, maybe? Hey, what do you think? McCarthy times were cruel enough to make us cry for all of us. And now it's worse. But let's get back. The 1950s, mid 20th century Fox, and all these movies, tears we shed, movies we still watch, TV was booming big. We loved the show of shows. Sid Caesar, Imogene Coca. You had Coca down pat. We loved your gut impressions. We loved, we loved you like we loved Dean Martin, Jerry Lewis, rhythm and blues, and jazz at the Philharmonic. If you played band, played orchestra like I did, you loved those Sousa marches, Jelly Roll, Ellington, Charlie Parker, Illinois Jacquet, back home in Indiana, Miles Davis's Donna Lee, box ageless Goldberg variations, the teenage Mendelssohn's scherzo uh, from A Midsummer Night's Dream, Hindemith's fourth temperaments, you loved night concerts, the nearest of Detroit's Canada to Windsor, your stepmother's brother's lover and wife. You wondered about ways we each talked about our moms and dads at work. We loved, we lived, Remember the rib lunch? We one noon wolfed down at Buddy's Barbecue, Claremont and 12th before 12th Street became Rosa Parks Boulevard? I bet you don't. Okay, that's what this poem's about. A Cass Tech high school dropout. You weren't happy at Monteith College, Wayne State's just then alternative school for fucked up folks like us. I didn't know much then. Somehow I did know enough to tell you, follow your heart. Fly where you could land, Chicago, New York. How did we, teenagers, figure this out? Don't go breaking my heart, not now. You found New York, you reached TV, starring in ads no watcher missed. You found New York, 
or skipped it. We loved you and your real, ripe voice, your face and heart. Let's fly back to our start. Let's land laughter and let it tell us how. You cared. I rhapsodized this crazy poem. Motown says, dance. Hi, Lily. I haven't sent that to her, but uh, I hope it has a future. Uh, we're getting down towards the end here. Uh, in 2012, uh, KQED, as somebody mentioned today, I think it was in one of the classes, uh, commissioned me to write a, a poem every month that was uh, pertinent to that month. And so uh, I went through all 12 uh, months, and you can find these poems. It's called the uh, California Report Poems, because that was the show. And uh, here's the one for April. Uh, it's called April the Coolest Month. Uh, April is interesting because it's uh, National Poetry Month, it's also uh, Jazz Appreciation Month, and it's also uh, National Library Week, so it's got a lot of strain on it. Here, here, here's the poem. April, the cruelest month? Says who? From Chula Vista to Bakersfield, she drove up to the San Joaquin Valley to hear him quote this? What was it about reading in college anyway? Fool, she ached to say, just look out the window. Your A plus blacks out sunlight. Breathe. She knew how April fools, but April pulls too. April pulls up National Poetry Month, breathe. April pulls up National Library Week and bass and drum roll, brrrrum, Jazz Appreciation Month. Lobbies buzz, with every spore afloat, adrift, ravishing her sinuses. She could feel April's mutual pulls flow out in her snail-soft exhale. Her family knows beet fields, artichokes, grapes. She breathed the early pull of April, a soul of melt and yearly turnaround. Unsprung, they kissed away distance and loved it up for lost time. All the way home to green old San Diego County, she missed him bad. She made up poems to sing for them over a crackling smartphone in the twilight chill of April, the coolest month. Thank you. And the last poem is uh, a poem called, at least that's a working title, this is a recent poem, I had just, uh, boy, everything's slipping and sliding. Little Richard. Uh, <laughs> I read about the um, Bacon Rebellion. Uh, uh, Bacon was, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of his first name. I think I put it in the poem here. He was a persnickety uh, uh, British aristocrat. Uh, who came over to uh, Virginia, which was the center of uh, tobacco farming. And in those days, uh, black and white uh, slaves, you know, the, the term they used for the, the, the white slaves, who were mostly from uh, the British Isles, uh, particularly from uh, Ireland, Scotland, and England, uh, they worked side by side with the African slaves. And in fact, the African slaves were treated much better because they were expensive, you know, to go and, and get. Uh, but they not only lived, uh, worked side by side, but they lived together, uh, they married, they had children together, and uh, they didn't have very long lifespans. Most didn't make it out of their 30s because the uh, work that they had to do was so cruel and so, so brutal. But this guy Bacon came over, he wanted to kill all the Indians, and uh, he had inherited a, 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 a huge, uh, uh, plots of land uh, to grow tobacco. And uh, the colonial governor uh, of Virginia had was, uh, amicable uh, relations with the Indians, and he hated this guy, Bacon. But Bacon formed his own private army, and some of the, uh, uh, the black and white slaves joined that army, and they were armed, and it scared the hell out of uh, the landed gentry because they saw that this was a danger. So for the first time we get 
uh, whites and Negroes, we get those terms, uh, introduced in 1676, uh, you know, 100 years before uh, our revolution, uh, because the uh, tobacco barons figured out that if blacks and whites united, it might be curtains for them. And so uh, we get uh, the black and white uh, dichotomy that we think always existed, but it didn't always exist. So uh, here's the poem, which is called American Beauty. Whoever thought those slaves we bought and damn near caught would count? Hands up. The gorgeousness of Chaka Khan and others' subtleties. The dignity of Phyllis Wheatley, Francis Ellen Watkins, Harper, peanut butter, green light, ragtime, Scott Joplin, red light. Do you know what I'm referring to when I say green light, red light? It was um, uh, Morgan, uh, what's his last name? Uh, an African-American invented the uh, traffic light. So every time you get messed up by a traffic light, you can, you can blame it on us again. He also invented the uh, gas mask. Um, Scott Joplin, red light, Jelly Roll Morton, sophistication, Duke Ellington, gas masks, Motown, doomed by whom? Who could have dreamed so many ways to bandage tired ass lineages? Blood plasma, drama, also Af African American invented uh, blood plasma, and died because uh, a segregated hospital uh, wouldn't admit him to use his own uh, invention uh, to uh, help heal him. Minstrelsy, vaudeville, transgress, transform, transfuse, transfuse, transform them blues. Let's give slaves what we're due. Thanks to us, life works through spirit still. We get the job done. Sometimes we turn Mexican or Nicaraguan, Dominican, Haitian, Palestinian, North Korean, Vietnamese. Sometimes we're all still Chinese. Affordable labor, real cheap. Be my neighbor. Who could have dreamed the rivers of forever our clever pain would power. Who remembers how it felt back then when Irish, Scottish, English men and women, servants, don't mention indentured, toiled cheek by jowl, row by row, alongside Africans on the same plantations. We labored, ate, and slept. We wed and didn't. Bond laborers raising babies shoulder to shoulder. We sweated, suffered, perished, young, together. Who remembers Bacon's Rebellion, 1676? Off the books, the biggest continental slave rebellion, tobacco, Virginia. Bacon's intention, kill all the Indians, every last one. Who could predict that's how we came up with white folks and Negroes? And who could have guessed the rest? When we tried to bust the back of bonded labor, smash our deep connections, we slaves reared up with guns, united, Euro, Afro. We turn fast against ourselves, and that's the way we stay. Whoever thought those slaves we bought and damn near caught would count, still counting. Thank you so much. You said John? Yes. Okay. And John says thank you out. Okay. Wow, that's, a, that's an old artifact. That looks pretty awesome. Yeah. It's not that old, but considering. <laughs> Being filmed. Under pressure.